Welcome to our second Ecos Lab. Today we will talk about new formats with four uh, speakers. We will talk with to Daniel Broncano, he is clarinetist and director of the festival Musica en Segura, Jaén. Johanna Broniet, ma manager of the Krakow Mysteria Pascalia Festival and member of the executive board of REMA. Miguel Ángel Marín, he is the director of the musical program of the Fundación Juan Marc, and Pierre Bonachot, deputy and artistic director of the Centre Culturel de Rencontre et Festival d'Ambronnet, and representative of the program Emerging Plus. This second Ecos Lab uh, is th done thanks to the collaboration with the University of Murcia, Acción Cultural Española, and the six uh, councils of Sierra Espuña, Aledo, Alama, Totana, Librilla, Mula, y Pliego. And today we are talking about new concert programs. I will ask the speakers to talk about their interest and relation with the topic, which is find new ways of, pre of presenting early music to encourage its interest and allow it to reach new audiences through the development of new concert programs. We will explore performative concepts, technologies, the relationship with other communicative and artistic languages, audience interaction, a spatial arrangement, and the identity connection with the concert venue. So, Daniel, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm so pleased to be here, to be invited uh, to this so interesting talk and so necessary. Um, I'm joining today from Segura de la Sierra. We are almost neighbors with uh, Sierra Espuña. So it's uh, quite nice that finally this year, this strange year with the coronavirus, we can, we can do something together. Um, so I'm the director and, and founder of uh, Musica en Segura. Uh, this is a music festival in Segura de la Sierra, officially one of the most beautiful villages in Spain. And the festival started seven years ago. Um, it's becoming a season of festivals rather than um, a yearly festival. And uh, we offer a very varied uh, program of music uh, with um, loads of types and, uh, and kinds of music, uh, from early music to electronic music, uh, classical music, um, contemporary songwriters, jazz, flamenco is quite broad, so that's why we call it Delicatessen Music Festival. Um, for us, the innovation is uh, in the DNA of, of what we do. They probably, the, uh, at the center of what we do is the location that is a really tiny village in the south of Spain with 150 inhabitants. Uh, so we play from the outside, uh, from the outside of the world all the time. Uh, that's the weakness and the strength of the festival because it's quite an experience to come here and that applies to the uh, artists, that applies to the audience and um, we've done, as I say, a strength of that because we play a lot with the natural landscape we've got, uh, creating specific formats like our musical hikes, our uh, musical sunrises in the middle of nowhere, uh, we play with the historical landscape, landscape of Segura de la Sierra, um, with the industrial landscape, with our uh, concerts in the olive oil factory. Um, so we really need to be very um, original to actually convince uh, the audience to come from many places of Spain and abroad uh, to our festival. Uh, in recent years, we've also been strengthening the, our own production, uh, creating um, our own formats and, and, and um, concerts that have been touring after, after that. So for instance, last year we um, invited uh, Spanish musician Emilio Villalba to collaborate with uh, two uh, rap singers in uh, creating these uh, Cantigas Raperas uh, that uh, follow the story of a fight, a, a historical fact here in, in Segura. Uh, from there went somewhere completely different to play with the idea of social confrontation and social fighting nowadays. And that was uh, taken there to other uh, places in Spain. So uh, 
Um, well, we can explain more of what we do in, in Musica and Segura, but that's a little bit the beginning of it. Thank you, Daniel. We will listen now to Johanna Broniec from Poland. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm uh, Joanna and I'm the manager and currently also taking care of the programming at the Misteria Pasalia Festival in Krakow. And um, the festival is organized by the Krakow Festival Office, which is the institution, public institution of culture that is taking care of organizing most of the biggest Krakow festivals. So we're actually working not only on early music, but uh, similar to Daniel, also on contemporary music festival, and film music festival. We have another department that is taking care of literary festivals and all the program of uh, Krakow UNESCO City of Literature. So our uh, there are many and aspects of our work that we're doing here in Krakow. And uh, early music is just one, but very important part of what we do. Uh, at, uh, at the F Misteria Pasaria Festival, we are trying to, especially from 2017, when we changed a bit the approach to the program and we decided to, uh, for a few years, show, through, through the free, few years, show the different cultural circles uh, in Europe and their uh, cultural and musical heritage and also show that it's all just part of the bigger picture that's to find try to find and show all the links that are linking uh, for example music coming from italy with music coming from poland and show how european it's really it really all is uh, we also decided then that uh, we should change a bit the approach to the concert formats because everyone is getting a bit bored just coming to a concert hall and listening to Bach or Handel all the time. So uh, we decided that we should show people the context that the works were written for. So we're trying to have as many concerts in the churches as possible, trying to find the spaces that are related to the period the music has been written in. So we are really trying not to uh, have medieval music in Baroque church, for example. Uh, since uh, since the last year, we also decided that to add to the program something uh, like liturgy. So we had the uh, Tenebre on Holy Friday performed, not really performed, but done in the liturgical setting with the priest and the choir and people just coming in for the prayer. And also the Resurrection Vespers that were done in the very beautiful monastery near Krakow. And they were really widely popular. So we are definitely going to also go into that direction because it shows people that this music was alive, is alive. It's not only, it was not meant to be performed in the concert hall. Uh, we are also trying to have a more theatrical approach and to just to try add some kind of dramaturgy to concerts. And I think my time is up. <laughs> Thank you, Joanna. Now is the turn of Miguel Angel. Um, hello, good morning. Thank you for the invitation. It's a very um, interesting, this kind of seminars we are having in a very regular way lately uh, due to the coronavirus. So there is sometimes some positive things within this very negative scenario we are, we are going through in this in these moments. I'm the music director of the Juan March Foundation. This is a private non-profit family foundation that has been acting in the realm of culture since 1955. This is a long way uh, of this activity. And since 1975, the foundation established its own building in the core of Madrid. And uh, uh, now it's very active in, in, in music, but also in art exhibitions and talks. Uh, in the particular field of music, what we have now is uh, a concert season of around 160 concerts 
from late September to early June, which basically means one concert a day as, as average, which is sometimes seems to be too much, but we try to keep going with that um, hectic activity. And perhaps the main, uh, and we go from medieval to contemporary music. So we, we have actually no real boundaries of music. Um, as far as they are, what we call say good music performed in a reasonably good way. Uh, so to say in very basic terms. Um, perhaps the main criteria of our concert season is that instead of doing concerts, we like to do series of concerts. So there is a very a strong sense of uh, correct creating a musical activity. We try to see ourselves not as programmers, but mainly as curators in the very similar way of curators in, in museums. Museums is, a kind of, in my opinion, a kind of institution that has been renewing the way they show art to citizens. And he said, for us, it's a place of inspiration, and we try to, to act as, as curators. And this basically means that we, have, uh, we assume that the value of a concert is not only what composers wrote down, of course, that's the core, is not only uh, what performance do with that pieces, with that works, but it can be also what programmers decided to show, how we decide to show composers and performers in a concert hall. And so, so the kind of three level activity, in two of them, uh, in one of them we have very little to do, it's what composer decided to put down. In the second level we have certain things to do in terms that we can select musicians, we, once we have selected them, it's up to them how they present music. But this is the third level, that of programmers, and we strongly reivindicate as a natural space for us to develop our uh, activity, which implies um, the selection of composers, the selections of performers, and the selection of how these two ingredients is presented to the audience. So, there is a whole idea for us of what we call, what I call the listening itinerary or the listening approach, which is all kind of decisions that uh, have a strong impact of how music is perceived by the audience. This implies, as I said, uh, selecting composers and selecting performers, but also implies selecting places of performance, selecting the order of the performance, uh, selecting um, what kind of um, ingredients we include beyond the normal um, uh, standard format, and that's the, the topic we will be discussing uh, today. And in the end, uh, it ends up uh, giving a huge space of uh, responsibility and a huge space of innovation to programmers. So um, I am always very strong defenders of the activity of, of programmers, which goes much beyond mere cultural management. Um, leading a festival or leading a concert season is not only dealing with management in the kind of bureaucratic administrative part of it. Of course, we need also to do that. But this is a very um, artistic, creative space, a huge one in the realm of programming, which is uh, uh, what we try to develop here in the Juan March Foundation in a very, um, as much as creative uh, level as, 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 as we can. So I, I could show later some particular examples dealing with early music, how we understand this idea of, of, of programming as a curatorial activity. Thank you very much, Miguel Angel. Now we will listen, please, to Pierre. Hello, everybody. I'm Pierre Bornachot, Deputy Director and uh, Artistic Delegate of the Festival d'Ambronay and the Centre Culturel de Rencontre, um, and also representative of the Emerging Plus project, which is um, cooperation between nine uh, nine structures in Europe uh, helping emerging ensembles since 2014 emerging is existing. Um, I would say that innovation in the concert formats is 
something really, really special and really important for all the, 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 the structures I've just quoted. For the festival, it's really important, though a little bit schizophrenic in the way I have to deal with it, because maybe we will explain it later, but the festival is taking place in a church with a priest, so we cannot do all the formats we would love to do, and there is here a little concern and a little uh, problem we have to deal with. Uh, concerning Emerging Plus, of course, it's one of the main goals that we try to achieve with the ensembles. Um, we, we strongly revendicate and we strongly encourage the, the innovation in the concert formats. And we are actually now working within Emerging Plus on a call for application, a call for uh, projects, innovating projects. So we are encouraging a lot um, these, these new formats because we strongly believe that the uh, renewing the audience and renewing the people who are coming to see the early music uh, needs to be done with innovation and through innovation. And of course, I will also going back to the basis, say that for me, um, for us, uh, early music is maybe the more innovative field of music in itself, uh, with contemporary music, of course, that you already quoted. So we have to emphasize on this because recreating works, uh, refining new composers is something really, really important and really innovative by itself. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, as you all know, we have four, uh, four groups, four ensembles listening that will interact afterwards. But also today in the evening, we will uh, have the opportunity or everybody will have the opportunity to watch, to watch this, uh, this conference. So mm, you have done already, but maybe there's people that will watch it and doesn't know exactly what do you, what do we mean with new concert formats what is new what is uh, so i will ask you to to talk a bit more about what do we mean actually when we talk about alternative or new formats what aspects of the performance are you most interested in so please joanna you are the first one so me first now <laughs> okay uh, what I think that a new format is uh, such a wide term that pretty much everyone can uh, have something else in mind when they think about new formats. Uh, for us, it's like really everything that is not a traditional, in a traditional sense of uh, a concert. What we mean by putting performance on the stage and audience people in the audience and like that's it performers are performing and people are listening everything that uh, gives people a way to like experience to have more of an experience than uh than just uh listening to the concert is really a new format for us the more theatrical setting in, of course, in a limited, even in a limited uh, sense of this word, like we can have candles, we can have a concert in the total darkness, we can, uh, performers can uh, expect to have the concert set in a, a medieval church that is really small and only allows like three people in, like everything that gets us out of this very strict order of the concert is a kind of new format for us. Uh, we did, for example, a, um, an oratorio by Draghi with costumes and uh, it was performed in a church at the altar and we had costumes, we have uh, choreography and interaction between the um, singers. Uh, and it's still one of the most well-remembered uh, concerts uh, during our festivals. Uh, what we can, any kind of a procession, for example, making uh, polychoral music sounds performed in a polychoral setting with choirs in different um, parts of the, uh, of the church or of the concert halls using 
the space that is provided, not only, I mean, you, taking a space that is provided for the concert, taking it apart and using it for a concert, for making the music more alive, showing people the context the work was written for, um, like taking different pieces and putting them together in a kind of a liturgical order. Like really everything that gets us out of this, we have uh, three pieces and they are performed one by one and that's it. So really it can be everything that can uh, like free uh, creativity from the ensemble, from the artists that we're inviting. That's Thank kind you. of a new format for us. Thank you. That was very interesting. What is new format for Miguel Angel Marin? Uh, well, I mean, alternative formats for me is a very broad uh, term to define everything that uh, differed or is an addition compared to what we can call a standard format, which is the one we received from 19th century. You know, concert history is a very long one that was established uh, at least from the very beginning of the 19th century format itself was already established more or less by that period and uh, and uh, all the things we add to this standard format can be considered alternative format and that for me includes many many different things and some of them coexisting it implies different lights it implies projections it implies or could imply uh, uh, speaking theatrical movement interaction with different arts changing uh, the setup of musicians, changing the setup of listeners, um, dressing. I mean, it can include many, many different things, depending on the project. Now, the critical, absolutely fundamental point for me in terms of thinking about alternative formats is what's the point of it? What's the intention? Why we need or why we want to change the format? And, uh, and I'm, I'm, I tend to be very critical in, 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 in that uh, to answer that, that question, because for me, the point of alternative format is not making the concert nicer, or is not, or not only, entertaining the audience. For me, the real value of alternative formats is presenting new ways of listening to music, is presenting new way of presenting, hiding, of uh, unknown aspects of music. That's the point. I assume that uh, we may be tempted to add lights to make it nicer or to add movement to uh, make audience feel more uh, engaged or make an uh, audience more entertained. And um, well, that's, that's, it, could be, it could be one reason, but for me, this is not the important reason. For me, the important reason is programmers exploring how by changing the standard format, we can present new ways of appreciating music, new, new ways of listening music, and at the end of that, at the end of the day, new ways of engaging audience uh, with the music. By not only by making it nicer, but by making it more, uh, more intense, uh, uh, by making it newer somehow, or by presenting new connections of music and different arts, for example, or making new connection of music and history, or music and context. I mean, there are many different things exploring, but uh, the critical thing or the critical point for me is, what's the point of it? That's, that's what we should answer. At the same time, we explore different formats, I think. Thank you, Miguel Angel. That was a very interesting approach. Uh, what do you think about that, Pierre? Yes, very interesting. And I think that Miguel Angel made a very good summary of what uh, innovative or alternative format could be. Um, I would just add a few elements. Um, I think that a new format, an alternative format, should and could engage both performance, I mean the artist, and the audience, or the audience, or both. But we could have a new format of concert uh, dealing only with the, the way the audience is feeling the, 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 um, or preparing the concert with the, like choosing, the, choosing the, the, the program or things like that. Um, I think personally that 
each concept which is not entering, bowing, playing, bowing, and going out is a new format of concert. That's exactly what Miguel Angel said about the, the traditional format of concert that we inherited from the, the 19th century. And I think that everything which is adding a piece of storytelling, and for me, it's the key word is story storytelling. How we, um, we, we, we have this, uh, all the things that we can tell and we can like fairy tale that we can uh, tell to the audience is something new in the in the program. And uh, also one other key word would be accessibility. And I think it's partially uh, answering the question of why are we doing that? What for us, the main goal is to, to make this music more accessible to a wider audience. So, well, that's it. I think that we need some storytelling and we need uh, to, that could be engaged both on the artistic side, but also on the audience side. Thank you, Pierre, Daniel. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna be the disruptive here. And I think that um, there's no really much um, innovation in our in our field. Sometimes I'm um, surprised and even irritated of what is um, regarded as innovation. Uh, to put an example, uh, last week, reading the critic of a, a concert in a Granada Festival, probably the biggest in Spain, the critic um, approached the uh, innovation or, or breaking the rules because the uh, conductor was wearing a blue shirt and because he talked to the audience in English and because he did a remark about the piano. So uh, is in a way uh, good news or bad news that actually there's a very uh, traditional uh, format that we are working from and anything else that you can add, uh, it's already regarded as innovation and that's to play from an iPad or to wear jeans or to add a light that is red. Uh, so it, in a way it's good that, that we've got so much space for innovation. Um, it's true that, that we are uh, talking about these elements, but not about musical creation, because probably there's uh, not much allowed, or um, uh, we are bound by the text so much, and uh, in a way it's difficult to, to uh, recreate what innovation should have been of Monteverdi started to add theater and, and creating opera, and uh, that's something that probably we have to, to think of. Um, I think that our space for innovation is from this so narrow, ultra-orthodox uh, field that we are working from uh, to Spotify. So I don't think that, that our, um, our starting point is only the 19th century uh, rigid con uh, concert format, but also the uh, digital playlist. And it's, it was so interesting what Miguel Angel explained about the curator as opposed to the uh, tracking list of a CD or the robot of Spotify. And um, what's the point of, of uh, innovating? I think that uh, our whole industry um, needs to seek for the future, for more engagement. And uh, we have to tell a story to uh, be a bit more intense, to provoke thoughts and to find more engagement. Um, so I agree with Miguel Angel that it's not about making the concert cuter, nicer, it's not only about marketing, it's that uh, we cannot do the same on and on and on. And uh, the, as I said, bad news is how rigid and how little is expected of us in terms of innovation, which is a good starting point to really innovate. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, that was very, very interesting. And that leads us to the next question also, which can be connected with what's the point of innovation? innovation. Um, is it uh, connect with the audience, or with the new audiences, as Pierre said? The question is, what elements do you take into account to construct the concert experience from this, the audience, from the audience perspective? Well, Miguel Angel, you can talk first. Uh, well, this is a very tricky question because we tend to uh, generalize thinking that there is one profile of audience and we tend to think as audience as a kind of one thing, uh, abstract, but more or less similar. 
what, uh, while what in fact what we have in our concert halls and in our festivals is different coexisting profiles of audiences with different listening capacities, with different expectation, with different needs, uh, and perhaps with different wishes of what they want to find in, in our concerts. So, um, so it's very difficult. And uh, part, of, part of the problem is that when we address that question, we sometimes don't realize beforehand that uh, it's impossible to give one answer to a reality which is not one audience, but different, different profiles of audiences. So perhaps to answer properly those questions, we should have first to think and to research a bit about the different profiles of coexisting audiences we have, uh, or at least what kind of ideal profiles of audiences we want to address our, our, our concerts. Because um, um, if we want to appeal to everyone we may well end it appealing to no one uh, because they, they, they may want different different things. Now, having said that, um, for me, the important thing uh, once we we have agreed, I think we more or less are in the same in the same uh, line of, of of this idea of storytelling. For instance, that that, that Pierre said that I also go along very much with that of perspective uh, listening perspective or this kind of idea. So once we have agreed that we have to tell a story and once we have agreed that as programmer, we not only put together composers, performers and works, but we build um, ways of listening, perhaps the chance to, uh, to construct an audience uh, experience is how to tell them what we want them to listen to or to tell them what's the approach we have prepared for them to go through a concert. In other words, how to communicate uh, our proposal or how to mediate with audience. That's the key term that is now, again, coming from museums, is the terms that um, is now very much into discussion in this kind of, of, of forums in which, uh, in which um, we uh, have to um, tell audience or prepare audience to receive the project we have conceived for them how we mediate with audience. And that for me, that's the kind of uh, key element. Uh, 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 and we can, I mean, the traditional way to mediate with audience is program notes. That's an element we also could discuss to what extent program notes are still uh, necessary and how we should approach program notes. And what's the point of program notes in, 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 in 21st century uh, where we have loads of loads of information and it's, we are, overloaded with information easily accessible through internet is this still a place for a program notes i think there is still a place for program notes of course and perhaps uh, the key uh, function of program notes is this one of mediate uh, with audience prepare audience uh, and give them some some uh, uh, keys of, uh, uh, of 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 the kind of proposal the kind of of the kind of story we want to tell with the concert we have programmed um, uh, so basically, I mean, one of the elements, key elements for me is, is, is this one, how to prepare audience and how to communicate with audience before the concert and even sometime throughout the concert as well with these new uh, formats of, of, of concerts. Hmm. Thank you, Miguel Angel. Uh, what is the key point for you, Pierre? Uh, just before giving my, my key points, I would have to, to, to tell something about uh, Miguel Angel just said about the program notes. Um, this is uh, an effect of the, the COVID situation here in Ambronay for the festival, the coming festival in September. We decided that there won't be, because we had to reschedule and reprogram everything uh, from, from zero actually, uh, we decided that there wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to have written program notes. So we decided that we could ask uh, actors to, to, to act the program, to tell the program to the, to the people. So we will have four actors present in the waiting, uh, waiting queue, and they will tell the people what they are going to hear in the evening. So it's like a new format of pre-concert, not a format of concert, but it's beginning here already. And we will see what it will be because it's an experimentation, but I think it will be nice to have 
something like entering in the story right uh, right before before the concert um, concerning the elements I would say that for me, right, for us here in Ambrone, one of the main uh, elements of uh, new format is, of course, the venue we are playing in. Because as I already said, we are for the, the, the main concert or the main concert venue, I would say, is a church, is a thousand places, a uh, thousand seats church. But there is still, it's still the church of the village, even if it's a small village also with 2000 uh, inhabitants. But it's still a church and there are still the masses in the church. So we, we can do everything we want. So it's right here we have the problem of the new formats in front of us. How do we deal with, uh, with uh, how can we attract new audiences if we cannot change um, a slight thing in the, in the concert format? So we are like in a, in a continual, continuous discussion with the priest trying to add new things sometimes uh, video and everything but it's it's really hard and for me the main element is the venue because in the ccr we have other venues and here we of course we can experiment and do everything we want uh but still it's it's i think it's a main concern for the festival and for the future of the festival that we have and we have to deal with so for me the main element is is the venue but of course there is also the presentation and there are a lot of different fields we can approach, but we can have a, a pedagogical concert, but we can also have a poetical way of having mediation with the audience. Um, and the use of transdisciplinary arts, of course, the use of modern technologies, as we already talked about. Um, and I think it's, it has to be considered as a whole with also the pre-concert, the post-concert, how we engage people, we invite people to talk with the artist at the end of the concert. So it's not only the concert by itself, but everything which is happening before and after. Thank you. I know that in Musica in Segura happens a lot before and after the concert. So Daniel is your turn. Also in Ambrone, but now Daniel is your turn. Yeah, here the, the experience comes or begins when somebody decides to come here and travel for three, four hours by car. So that, that makes it a, an event, an, an occasion. Uh, for us, as, as Pierre said, uh, location, 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 that's for us um, part of the content, I would say. And it it's begins the, the storytelling. So um, uh, when we do a, a musical hike, I think that um, people listen to music in another way. They open up their senses even more. Um, sometimes we don't have a preconceived idea of what uh, we would like the audience to feel or to think, but I just think that when we put different contrasting elements in place, uh, that stimulates the brain and uh, makes an experience for the performer and, the, and for the audience alike. Uh, just to put another ex example of another project that I'm related to, um, it's a program in November related to coronavirus uh, in a pharmaceutical company in Leiden, the Netherlands, and it's an early music program related to uh, uh, plagues and disease uh, in the house of uh, medical research. Uh, where it is literally happening now. So I think that that, that of course, uh, builds a story itself on, on how um, humanity would probably feel in a similar way uh, in the face of a similar adversity some centuries ago. So that's what I mean, that the, the, the uh, venue and the location can already trigger the storytelling. Uh, here in Musica and Segura, we do also um, concerts in my living room uh, with a fireplace and 40 people and of course that opens up another scope of things uh, with a really intimate um, uh, interaction with the artist where you can feel them breathe and sweat and you can really hear the the real sound uh, i guess that in the next question we'll talk much more about uh, digital formats because of course i think that that's the the theme nowadays with the COVID. Yes, we will. But before that, we will listen to Joanna. 
Uh, well, uh, I'd like to go back to what Michael and Hel said, uh, that it's really difficult to uh, listen to the audience because there are so many different people in the audience. We have actually, a very, we are very lucky to have many uh, young people in our audiences, but that doesn't mean that they are the only part of the audience. We have children, we have young people, we have people coming from different backgrounds to elderly people and each one of them is interested in something else and is interested in experiencing music in different way. So it would be very difficult to listen to so many different voices, especially as one thing they can agree on is just give me more Bach. <laughs> it, and it doesn't matter if we have an edition dedicated to music coming from Spain or from uh, Italy or from France, they just want Bach. So uh, we try to have different formats so that everyone can find something for themselves and just participate in the concerts that they are interested in, either because if of the music we're performing or the composer or the group or the, um, or the uh, venue or something. We, for example, have each year the concert that is located in the salt mine. Uh, it's 100 meters underground. There's the beautiful chapel carved entirely in salt. And each year we have a concert there for around 300 to 400 people. It's a very exclusive event and it also needs to be uh, kept very small. And we try to uh, get groups inspired by this location to prepare a program that would go very well in this very intimate setting. We have a, also a series of late night concerts. We think of them as more dedicated to uh, younger audiences that want to experience something very uh, also intimate and very uh, different from the, the things that we can offer in at a normal concert. Uh, venue, for example, or even in a church, but it's 8 p.m. So these 10 p.m. concerts are also giving different story, telling different story to the people that are participating in the concerts. And also to answer uh, the call of our more religious uh, oriented part of the audience, because the festival is uh, mostly about passion and Easter music, we created the series of liturgies because people also to show them, them that there's the festival and that it doesn't cancel the religious experience of the Holy Week. It's just to make it more, uh, more full in a way. Uh, so that, that, that is the way we try to answer the, to different needs of our audiences. Thank you, Joanna. I think Pierre wanted to add something. Yes, just, just something that Joanna said about um, there are as many people in the audience and it's quite difficult to, to, to know with the innovation and the new format to whom we will be addressing and if it won't shock this or this part of the audience and just, it's, just, it's not a solution that I give, it's just something uh, I, can, I can see is that once we are here in Ambronet touch, touching to the repertoire itself, it becomes more difficult to, to be unanimous and to have both our older audience and our young audience. And, and it's something I've, I've seen. It's not, it's not true for the, when we touch to the, 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 the staging part of the concert. Uh, then everyone is quite happy with that. And we, we, try, we, we have a, a quite a unanimous uh, appreciate, appreciation of the concert. But, but once we touch to the repertoire itself by making crossovers, or making new arrangements, or it's, it becomes quite difficult. But, but then I think for my part that we have more possibilities to touch a, a, a quite younger audience, but then it becomes difficult with the, with the other ones, the more used audience. It was just a reflection about that. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, you will be also the first one to answer the next question, uh, which is we, we are living on the technology revolution. And um, well, 
early music groups have to adapt also and sometimes with fear uh, to the technologies and the digital era. So what can new technologies provide to early music that they haven't already done? Well, I'm happy that I have to answer first to the more tricky, uh, the trickiest question. I think it's, well, it's difficult to answer this question to, to, but what could we imagine? Because there have been a lot of things that have been already done. Um, I think that from my point of view, the new technologies uh, that have to be used very carefully, I'm not very, well, I'm, when, when something is proposed to me with new technologies, I, I really want to go deeper in the project and to see how it will be used and that it's just not, not just a gadget that is here to, to, to impress the, the, the people and no, it's something that must have this uh, deep uh, sense as, uh, as we said earlier. And um, I would say that something that has to be done is it to be done is in the interaction with the, the audience. I think it's quite very a deep subject that we have to, to search for. And we had already a few experiments, but not very, not completely achieved as uh, making people vote during a concert or things like that. It was a little bit, well, it was very interesting, a little bit messy sometimes, but it was really interesting. And I think in this interaction between audience and, and musicians, not necessarily during the concert, but it can be, as I already told before the concert in preparing it, and at the end of the concert in giving your impressions, your feelings, what you, it can be something that can be that can be done. But of course, um, it can be difficult. Well, if we only talk about visual arts and things like that, it's really, really interesting also in the format of the concert, but still uh, it engages more uh, technicians, more people to deal with it and more people to, to prepare it. So it's, uh, it's very interesting, but I, I, would, I would mainly stay on the interaction between audience and, and uh, an artist. Thank you, Pierre. Daniel, what do you think? Yeah, I'm thinking about um, a great opportunity for more distribution, more ways to reach people, uh, to connect with the audience and to offer them to uh, listen to early music and classical music uh, through other devices and, and uh, create an experience as well. And uh, I guess that's the challenge in the foreseeable future um, and you can think of what you are doing in uh, Echos Festival, where you are offering these uh, mini concerts uh, that uh, create an experience. And actually, are, they have the uh, DNA of what your festival is. And, and um, I think that's a, a success. Um, I'm personally working on a new uh, complement, a complementary way of reaching new audiences uh, this, particular, this particular year where we are gonna have huge audience uh, limitations and restrictions, how to combine a live performance uh, with live streaming, uh, paid uh, with quality and with extra content that is only broadcast online uh, with interviews uh, backstage with exclusive content that is only broadcast online um, because I think that, that we've got to, to use this. Uh, and hopefully, because of the situation we are now in, in 2020, probably that's going to be something positive for the future to uh, work in the basis of these new technologies uh, regularly. Um, and how to make it with quality, how to make people... Uh, dive into the music and uh, to enjoy it to enjoy it with enough enough depth i think that's that's important thank you daniel uh, johanna johanna you also had to to do a digital version of your festival this year what do you think about this topic yeah uh we've been kind of forced into the uh, online festival program within that we had to organize within like two or three weeks 
and uh, thankfully we had very good relationship and partnerships with Polish radio and uh, Metzl TV so we had material and we could kind of negotiate putting it online for free for everyone uh, and what was uh, something that we discovered during that festival is that there's a great need in people for that kind of experience not only to have a way to watch the concerts that they couldn't attend, attend otherwise, uh, but also to interact between each other. We had a very good traffic and very good uh, activity on Facebook because we put them only on Facebook, uh, which uh, was a good idea at the time. But I think that after half of a, almost half a year of being uh, constantly in the online format of the concerts, people are getting a bit tired of only attending online concerts. Um, but this is something that we are definitely going to explore in the future, even if we have the festival happening live. Uh, in this new reality, we're trying to find new ways and find new ways to have a festival happen in Krakow, even if we will be forced in the second wave or third wave or whatever of um, limitations but uh, we will be definitely trying to record or stream at least part of the concerts and make them available for the people outside of Poland and people that couldn't be in Krakow in this period otherwise. Uh, but talking about new technologies and what can they do for early music I'm actually on the same uh, side as Pierre uh, I mean, the music itself doesn't really need new technologies to be heard and to be, to be there. I think the new technologies and I mean, we should ask ourselves a question, what do we really mean by new technologies? Is it just streamings, recordings? Because that has been happening for over <laughs> many, many years. So just, this is not something new. I would think about new technologies like something like there are projects that are trying to virtually recreate the space and the um, acoustics of the um, places that pieces were originally written for. And this is something that I would be very interested in having in the festival to give people the chance to experience how the piece sounded very, very originally the first time it has been performed. So that is kind of a thing that uh, new technologies can still do for early music, I think. You are right. Uh, this uh, technology, the use of technology in the streaming has been done already before. And the Fundación Juan Marc is one of the exponents of that in Spain. So Miguel Angel Marín, you can talk maybe more about that or what do you want? Yeah, I mean, this this um, uh, situation that has all been forced to encourage, which is streaming, uh, was somehow natural for us because we have been streaming all our concerts for the last two or three uh, concert seasons. And we've been recording all concerts since 2010. So it was already a natural side of our activity. Now, uh, for me, the, the, the novelty in these situations is to be aware that uh, new technology has been used as a kind of um, a supplement uh, of the second hand ideal way of listening to music when audience couldn't be present live in the concert. I mean, we probably all agree that concert itself cannot be, uh, cannot be uh, false by any streaming, um, streaming uh, 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 transmission. Of course, uh, many of us are happy to ac uh, access to music through streaming or through recordings that cannot uh, be real uh, and enjoying in, in, in the place. But um, music itself, as uh, Joanna said, um, actually to, to the pure enjoyment of music always implies being there. Now, if we are going to use uh, new technologies, and the way I'm thinking in the last few weeks of using new technologies is not just stream what uh, should be uh, enjoyed live, but uh, using the most of new technologies, which means that creating new series of concerts 
making the most of uh, new technologies. So instead of, uh, instead of replicating digitally a concert that was performed live, which is what we have been doing for this situation, we are now creating from a start new uh, concerts conceived in the natural way of uh, the digital world, which implies, in our particular case, selecting fragments of concerts we've been recording live here in our space and creating a new story with these uh, segments of fragments of concerts. In other words, it's just um, uh, programming concerts in a digital format. Um, again, music itself cannot be uh, enjoyed in the most intense way if you are not there. But if we are going to use new technologies, uh, now my, my view is just using new technologies with the strong points of new technologies, rather than just um, rather than replicating in digital form what was conceived in, in physical in physical concert hall. So we are now thinking of new programmings, new way of programmings um, uh, that are not just replicating concerts, but are conceiving new ways of listening to music, mixing different concerts by uh, uh, explore the full potential of, of new technologies. Absolutely, this is a completely new horizon for all of us. And I think we are now giving the first steps in, the, in, this, in, this, in this space. And probably in the future, uh, new technologies will be very important in all our institutions, even though we will probably always want to keep alive concerts, just presenting music in itself alive. Thank you, uh, Miguel Angel. Uh, that was very interesting also, and we have still some minutes to answer the, the last question, uh, which is also a useful conversation uh, between early music performers and early music uh, groups. And it's, what is, do you think uh, about the relation or counterposition between the search of innovation and the historically informed performance? So, Daniel Broncano, you are the first one. How I liked how you pronounce my, my name, you sounded Italian now. <laughs> and, uh, I just wanted to make a, a, a comment to what Miguel Angel just said. And um, I'm not 100% um, with you that um, when the audience is present is the, uh, always the ideal, which is not uh, changeable. And I think that in a way we idealize that. And I think that um, when you go to a concert and um, you are almost late because you've been running in the underground in London and the concert hall is hot and uh, we can think of the next two years with a mask and there's noise and the sound is not that amazing. I don't want to idealize that actually you are going to be more moved by the music or you are going to, uh, it's going to be more meaningful for you that if you listen to that on Spotify on a really good recording where you can feel the soul of the performance. Uh, because maybe you are in a better uh, mental state or because maybe you are at the right time or because of uh, such a long number of reasons that actually your musical experience can be really deeper, not life, uh, where you are not there. Uh, we really have to think that because I think that, that uh, I don't agree with that maximum that, that um, life always better, not really. Um, and I think that streaming is a mix of both where you can be at your home. And uh, I think that we have to consider that. Um, counterposition of innovation and, and uh, historical informed performance, I'm in favor in general. Uh, I, just a, a consideration is that, that uh, we are not touching the content. We are just touching nowadays the roping. And I guess that it was already innovation when it was uh, composed, performed, when it was uh, alive. I guess that then it was again innovation when 40 years ago this fashion of, of um, coming back to that and not just uh, continuing with the 19th century tradition. I guess that then it, it was a huge innovation and I guess that now as I say is there's no really much, maybe I'm completely wrong, but I don't think there's much innovation in the sound in the music in what you listen if you close your eyes or if you just listen to a recording is just the roping so that's the innovation we are talking about 
And I think that's, uh, well, it was just an idea or, or consideration. I, I, I'm in favor of the counterposition of innovation and historically informed performance. Are you, Johanna? Well, uh, I'm a bit, I have to admit that I'm a bit like open-minded purist when it comes to the historically informed performance. So I'm actually open to uh, ideas that the artist can have about performing it in different way that it was really written for. But uh, I think everything has its time and place. And as I have can have like one concert dedicated to kind of an experiment, but it needs to be clearly stated that it is really indeed some kind of experiment and not, uh, not to get people ideas that it can be really every time performed in different way. Uh, so really the way it's performed in a historically informed way, it's kind of the more important than giving it a bit of a new format. So if I have an ensemble that has a very uh, high quality performance of uh, uh, pieces of or, or composer pieces or something like that, but they are against doing giving it any kind of a format that is not a traditional concert, then I will rather choose having it in a normal setting and traditional concert hall than uh, trying to find someone who can provide a lesser quality, but in a better format. Let's call it like that. So I think it's important to look for new formats, let's call it new formats, because it can also be like putting the piece in its original context. So how really, how new is this new format? Uh, but, uh, oh, but really the music and the historically informed performance is like a most important thing for me in this looking for new formats kind of experience and journey. Thank you, Ivana. What is the most important for you, Miguel Angel? Well, um, I think that um, this um, association between innovation and historically informed performance are for me a completely two different things that may or may not interact each other you can be very innovative in certain ways and be very conservative in terms of performance and the other way around so for me are two, two completely different things and for me the important thing is that to be aware that um, historically informed performance is just one way of approaching early music um, and it of course, it's not the, the only way. Uh, it not necessarily be the best way to do it. And uh, we all agree, I suppose, that uh, historically informed performance is more than a modern way of approaching music than an early way of approaching music. I mean, historically informed performance uh, tend to be presented as something very authentic, close to the composer, and, uh, and it's sometimes quite the opposite thing is more close to our view, our modern view of how approaching to uh, music from the past. Uh, so for certain, certain point of view, historically informed performance is a very broad uh, um, um, undefined um, uh, term, blurry term to um, approach music from the past whatever, regardless the period of the past. You can be historically informed performance if you approach it to music to Schoenberg. In the same way, you can be historically informed performance uh, when in performing uh, Monteverdi or Palestrina. So, I mean, this is a very complicated, slippery term uh, that has been uh, uh, dressed to a kind of glamour uh, approach and, uh, and, uh, and sometimes in a very well, I, I, I wouldn't say that um, are, are, we are cheating audience, but um, it's a very confused term at the end of the day. And, and for me, it doesn't tell really very much. Uh, and definitely it has nothing to do with innovation in any case. Um, of course, I admit, I'm, 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 and, uh, and I, can, I can agree that um, this has been a kind of revolution in the way we've been approaching to, to uh, um, historic um, repertoires. 
and it has been a very fruitful um, field of renewing uh, performing approaches. And in that sense, I think we should be grateful to this movement that used to be an authentic performance and now it's called historically uh, informed performance, but in the end, it's very much the same. You can to uh, imagining how music was performed in the past, but assuming always that we will never be able to know exactly how music was performed in the past. Or which is even worse, we are lucky to not know exactly how it was, because if we knew how it was performed in the past, we may might not like very much how music was performed in the past, and we would prefer how music is performed today. Um, so I'm just trying to kind of uh, to kind of criticize a bit of put under question this this uh, idea of association between a nice, good, trendy thing and historically informed performance that may not be connected, and and uh, and uh, even though it, is, it has been good for us in terms of renewing our approach to performance in the past. Uh, it's not necessarily always be the best way. It definitely is not the only way to 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 perform uh, music from the past. Well, I don't know. Perhaps it doesn't give you a proper answer. It's more kind of a critical answer of of this idea of of, of historically informed performance. It was a very interesting answer. Thank you, Miguel Angel. What do you think from Ambroné, Pierre? Well, of course, it's really really interesting because. Everything is going from this, you know, music from the past. And the key word that uh, Miguel Angel just said is imagination. We are, of course, we are playing in the rule of arts, but we just, we are just imagining what, what it could be at the time. And just the word imagination connects us to the world of storytelling. That means that there's a lot that we, and we have, we need to, to tell the people how we get to that point. Are you artists did, uh, get to that point of uh, an achievement of a concert of a work and of course you have the the, the field of imagination is much much uh, wider in the early music than it can be and playing uh, a string quartet I, I mean and or a symphony uh, with a symphonic orchestra so i think we and there is also something related to the craft uh, the things that you are like rebuilding reconstructing uh, pieces that have never been played uh, still in the rule of art, but with your uh, imagination, your uh, interpretation, and the, the thing you put it in the in the work as a personal uh, artist. So, I think there is no opposition between uh, innovation and historically informed performance. As I said earlier in this intervention in the conference, for me, uh, early music is maybe the more innovative one of the more innovative field, innovative field in, in music so there is no opposition no counterposition but but something really complementary and it doesn't mean because uh, an approach is um, is historically informed that it cannot be innovative as Miguel Am had said it's two different things and and for me of course some someone who is dealing with music and the works really in a historically informed way can also think about new formats, about new way of presenting the results of this uh, historically informed work. Thank you, Pierre. Um, Julia, our digital manager, will invite now the four ensembles that we have, Prisma, Lampastrata, Astrophy and Stella in Anachronia to join the conversation. Uh, but in, in this time, I don't know if Joanna, Miguel Angel or Daniel want to add something or uh, in case they don't, we will listen to Johanna Bartz from Astrophy at Stella that has a, a question. Hello, um, do you want my question now or my, my comments? Uh, well, uh, the question, I think. Yes, um, so most of my questions were already kind of answered in the conference, so thanks again for the really uh, nice um, uh, contributions of the four of you. Um, I, another question developed, which is, um, you saw it probably already. So um, programming, let's say everything that counts as innovative concert format requires a much more flexible infrastructure, more specialized staff, um, technicians or visual artists. 
and also a lot of more communication and flexibility from both the ensembles and the festivals. And my question uh, to you is, um, do you think that the role or the relation between programmers or curators, as Michel Andre um, called, called it, um, the relation between the programmers and the ensembles change more uh, from a way, from a more traditional way of, like, let's say, simply inviting um, a group to a concert series to communication and um, developing um, new formats together, like more cooperative work between and more creative work actually between the programmers and the groups. Mm. Can I can, can I answer that? Uh, well, definitely, Johanna, this is has to be the way. It's impossible to innovate or to develop new formats if we don't have a new or a more fruitful way of, of negotiation. I usually define programming as a negotiation of three sides. It's explicit negotiation between programmers and musicians, artistic negotiation, not economic negotiation. That's also there, but artistic negotiation, and also an implicit negotiation between programmer and audience and musicians and all this. this is a kind of, of, of triangle and my experience is that the more you want to innovate the more uh, you want to change the format the more you have to negotiate or uh, discuss with musicians and um, even though at the end of the day those who have the money have the right of deciding and therefore it's programmers who in the end decide who is going to play but uh, you will be wrong or you will be mistaken as a programmer if you think that because if you have the money, you have the right to decide, it's only your own decision. It has necessarily to be a joint decision. The more engaged musicians are with the new program or the new, uh, uh, the new concept or the new storytelling you want to tell, the more successful will be the, the results because musicians need to be part of it. That's very clear. But uh, sometimes I've got a feeling talking to some colleagues that uh, programmers tend to just decide by themselves, are kind of, uh, kind of ordering musicians what to do. Musicians probably will accept at the end of the day if you force them to do something, but they won't do it truly as part of their artistic uh, results if they are not implied in the process of, of building and the process of negotiation. So definitely you have to talk to them. And that implies time, implies, um, sometimes changing your mind implies negotiation and, 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 and that means, means effort and means energy and means time and means money at the end of the day. So that's why some people are reluctant to negotiate because it means more work. I completely agree. I cannot. Um, I, I really like the idea of Miguel Angel how you explain the, the negotiation with the artist and, and with the and the with the audience. And I think that that um, is an unequal negotiation because I think that the purpose is the audience to have a better product and to enjoy, and um, they are gonna pay more when you offer more significant work, more important art. And on the part of the programmer and the artists, it means more work because if you do something more original that is not your ordinary program, that means more work. So I, I'm not sure if it's, um, as Johanna said, about um, another infrastructure, uh, another workers, I think it's just more work. And it's the, the you have to make uh, time and money available. Yeah, not, not necessarily money, but more effort time uh, to do something special and to do more, but, but I think that's the beginning of the wheel, not to, to do something, to, to have very important and significant work so that the uh, audience can then fund that. Yeah. Can I okay. add something, uh, Jorge? Um, of course, the, the, the question of the effort uh, is really, really important there, and it has to be something that the, the programmers are doing willingly and want to do. Uh, to, with their audience. And it brings me to something that Johanna said in her question in the chat. She said, leading us to, to conceive projects with the audience, for example. It's something we believe, we hardly believe in here in Ambonnet, we strongly believe in here in Ambonnet is how we can build 
things together with the audience. And it's really, really a big effort. It's something that's really hard. It's, it's much more easier to just bring the concert on stage and say, people come to see it and come to hear it. Okay, but building something together, it's like three, five or four months before we can have, uh, you know, like um, uh, asking people what they want to hear. Well, but it's a really an effort, but it's something we have to do. And, and, and uh, of course, in, in the dialogue between artists and programmers and audience, well, then everything is, is perfect. But it's a big, big, much more a big effort than simply doing the concert. Thank you. Uh, Miguel Angel, you want to say something? And just one, well, I suppose we are perhaps running out of time. I think good programmers, or good programs are those who are against audience wishes, somehow. So we, we, we I mean, I, I don't want to be um, extreme, extremist in this idea, but audience, I mean, good, good um, cultural proposals are those that somehow shake a bit audience expectation. So I, I, I quite like the idea of, of Pierre of, 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 of consulting, of you know, keeping audience in mind, in mind but always with, the, with this also, with this bit of sometimes, sometimes going a bit against audience and try to, to find and to, to surprise them. Uh, because you, you, we shouldn't expect that audience sometimes uh, are, are ready to, to discover new things. They may be ready to expect and to receive new things, but perhaps they, they don't have the, the ability uh, or the knowledge to, to know what new things are there for them. Again, we go back to the previous point of completely different and varied profiles of audiences, and depending who you ask, you will get completely different answers. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that I'm, I don't like your idea, just kind of um, uh, made it more, more, more complicated and, and, and also more uh, varied. Yeah. I, I agree with you. Just I was meaning that before we can surprise them, we have to attract them in the... In the, in oh, the, yeah, yeah, the yeah, yeah. The first step is to build something with them, and then when there is the trust and, uh, and the fidelity of the, of course, we can bring them something else. It's not mm. all the festival will be done with, with the audience. Yeah, it's yeah. just maybe to attract new audience also. It's, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a good way. Thank you. I'm inviting Joanna to, uh, to answer the next question, which is from David Gutierrez from Anacronia. Anacronia was one of the ensembles that uh, was supposed to be here this summer and they have recorded one of the video clips that we are publishing with this digital version of the ECOS Festival. So, David, it's your turn. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, my question is about new format or about uh, who means new format? Because at the beginning, I think, uh, Miguel Angel uh, said that um, if you play Haydn in a different way, it can be a new format. Uh, this reminds me because, uh, for example, in Anacronia, we play Haydn with Gamba and Hasbicord, at the time when the cello and for the piano were more and more present, uh, based on a series of, of concerts of Abel and Christian Bach. So uh, my question is about new format. Uh, do you consider that the fact of change instrument or play uh, instrument less usual makes a format new? And on the other side, uh, for a young ensemble, uh, sometimes uh, do a new format could be uh, maybe a little risk. So. What do you think about that for, for us, a young ensemble, is what is the good point to do an, a new format and what is the risk about that? Uh, well, uh, if it comes to the pieces performed in by different instruments uh, from different periods that they were written for, it's... Um, well, it's a bit difficult question for me because I'm like, as I said, I'm a bit of a purist in, in this kind of way, but uh, I'm not against this kind of experiments, if we call them experiments. And uh, I could see programming a concert like that in a small concert series that we're doing. Uh, so it's certainly, it certainly can be called a new format because it's not something that you can usually uh usually experience in the concert hall and, or in the festival so it's in a way it is a bit of a new format i think uh it could be really interesting to listen to this kind of uh, music but as i said for me personally i'm not like i'm shouldn't be uh perceived as a representative of a wider group of either promoters or audiences or anything but performed it's, it's just my per personal feeling 
that uh, I could listen, I could be interested in this kind of music, but uh, in a form of an experiment. Um, but yeah, it is a new format in a way. <laughs> Yeah, maybe, maybe, uh, sorry. No, no you, you, you go, Pierre. No, maybe I was just going to say that, as for me, here in Ambonne, as long as you are telling us a story around this, all the choices that you make, it's not a problem. It's an experimentation, of course, but, but you have to tell me why, and so that I can tell the audience why, and also you will tell the audience why while you will be playing. And concerning your second question about, do we, t do we take risks in making new formats? I would say, I don't know, it depends on the programmer you have in front of you. So it seems that here you have some programmers that would be very happy to do experimentations and to try things. But but you can see with, with Joanna also that you cannot do maybe experimentation on all the fields. So you have to talk with your the programmers you have in front of you. And of course, um, to measure the risk that you are taking by addressing them new or shocking or provoking uh, formats. You have to, to see the balance between that. Yeah, I, I was about to say something similar. I mean, if you want to go outside the main routes, you will have to take risk. Full stop. I mean, you need to take risks. Now, you can measure the risk, you can justify your risk, and you can uh, uh, um, somehow compensate your risk with other different safe elements of your proposals. And um, if you see in historical terms, uh, uh, Bach music was performed with piano for many decades. Then it, it became to perform only with harpsichord and you were killed if you play Bach with piano. And nowadays we are happy to accept both proposals. And even we're happy to accept uh, sometimes Bach with 40 piano. Harpsichord French, harpsichord music is happening the same. Some pianists are performing Copéran with piano and it could work or it could be a disaster depending on how you combine things, depending on how you justify your approach, depending on your artistic side of, of your approach and depending somehow also, but not exclusively of historical terms as well, and depending on many different things. So in broad general terms, you, my opinion is that musicians are allowed to do almost whatever they want to do, but the farther they go from the norm, the farther they go from the conventions, uh, the more ready they have to be to justify their proposal and the risk uh, the risk it will be. But you have to be, I mean, you have to assume risk. It's just a matter of how you approach that, how you deal with that, how you justify, how you measure, I mean, how you, in, in, in general terms, how you, how you think the whole proposal. Thank you, Miguel Angel. We have also, between the ensembles today, we have Paula from Lampastrata. Uh, Lampastrata has been one of the uh, groups that were uh, in Sierra Espuña two years ago. And what, here's her question. Okay, hello. Um, it is more a general question because uh, for us, uh, audience experience is really important. So we try to connect with the audience by making little changes, for example, by trying different locations that was an aspect that we already talked about it, and by making audience think a pedal point in some pieces. So what other aspects as a performer we can add in our concert in order to interact and connect with the audience? Thank you so much. So what other experts can we consider? Uh, maybe Daniel want to answer that. I'm not sure if I quite understood the question. Sorry, the sound wasn't very, very good. So it's about how to connect more with the audience beyond the concert. Uh, yes, sorry. Yes, this, this is the question. Sorry if my audio doesn't work, okay. I will read it uh, again for the audience, uh, if you don't mind, because of the sound. So uh, Paula is saying that uh, they add changes in their concerts in order to interact with the audience. So what other aspects as, perf as performers can, we, can they add in order to interact and connect with the audience? I love the idea of changing the order. So um, I'm just curious about it. Um, 
so is it that that you add uh, you add the uh, playing list according to the to the audience or to their mood or the order in the program i'm not sure what what you change um because that would be uh, is is that you you change the menu according to what they want um no can can you hear me now yes i yeah yeah we can hear you Okay, no, um, I was trying to tell that for us, the obvious experience is really important. So we had little changes in our performance. For example, we tried that the audience sing with us, making them to sing capital uh, note in our in our work from the Renaissance, for example, or uh, changing the disposition during the, the concert. So what else we can do as a performance, as a performance? So I, I can think of, uh, yeah, it's so exciting for the audience to sit on stage, uh, to see the performers close by. I guess we cannot do that until 2023, probably, because of safety reasons. I know some uh, chamber ensembles that have a device uh, for the audience to choose the, uh, this was a string quartet that did this a roulette with all the quartets of, of Beethoven and they decided like what to play um, and I guess in our festival it's so easy to create interaction between the audience and the artists because we operate in a 150 inhabitants village so um, they at the second day they know the name of the performance and the name of their children and it's quite natural for us to to get to know the performers uh, much more um i guess in our case uh, talking to the audience in a an informative informal way is normally important uh, and that's a little bit our our brand uh to close to sorry to break that sort of uh, third wall is quite important for us thank you from Johanna. Oh, Johanna wants to answer, I think. Johanna Bart, did you? Okay. Yes, if I may just answer to that a little bit. I think a key point is uh, actually also on a general topic of having an innovative format is we are aiming for that, I think, because we need to, or we try to make this music uh, relevant in a way and relevant for the audiences. So they have a personal relation somehow to what happens there on stage and we try to go away a bit from this traditional concert format maybe we are afraid that audiences lose the contact to what's what's going on you know it's not something uh, relevant for their lives anymore and i think i mean as daniel said already uh, this idea of having an informative talk is for sure nice or having like a concert where you involve like questioning questions for the audience questions and answers uh, or the audience is participating in some way and i think a way could also be to to um, go a bit beyond just the musical picture of that time but also present details for example of of that period or of that time and very often we tend a little bit to to present things that that are similar to our time so people see something familiar but for example i have a, a colleague in basel who who does the opposite in his project and he says he's interested in um uh, showing things to the audience that are completely different uh, for example, he said like Palestrina, he, when he, he composed the motet and the next moment he went outside, he went, he crossed the marketplace of his town and then somebody was just tortured to death there. So people would live in a completely different reality than we do nowadays. And this is also another approach, but it creates a sort of relation between the audience and um, the music that's performed on stage. Thank you, Johanna. We have a last question before ending this wonderful talk. Uh, so now we will listen to Alon from Prisma. Thank you, Jorge. So just a, a very quick presentation of, uh, of uh, Prisma. Uh, we're an ensemble of four people. We're a quartet and we had the great luck to be part of the emerging program five years ago. And I think from the very beginning, uh, innovation was a, an important 
thing for us, an important element. And our first uh, CD, The Seasons, was uh, more dealing with the sustainability, sustainability and nature. And for that, we also have a children uh, format. And so to follow up on what uh, Miguel Angel Marin said, um, different formats for different uh, audiences, to me, it would be interested, I would be interested to, to know a little bit more if you could elaborate also uh, which, um, which audiences with which kind of formats do you, um, do you approach. The, our second CD, Il Transilvano, is having to do with cultural um, transfers, cultural exchange between Hungary and Italy already in the 16th uh, century, but it also involves folk music, which is in a way timeless. And I should say also that uh, every musician in Prisma plays more than one instrument or also sings. So in, in a way, this is also um, yeah, a feel for, for our innovation. The, the next project that we would like to, to start uh, performing with actually came now in the Corona time. And uh, the, pro the project is called um, Misteria Pascalia because it deals with the Holy Week, with the passion story but also with the Pesach Jewish tradition and the Muslim tradition of the sacrifice, feasts, etc. It, it brings together um, um, gospel songs and spring songs from different traditions. So we are, we are very much in this, in this uh, cultural transfer sort of um, topic and sustainability was very important for us. And that's why here I come to my question. Um, we would like in the future not to just uh, travel to a place, play a concert and then head back. We would much uh, prefer to build a connection with the community. We have a program of, um, well, a plan to develop audience in, in different places. And uh, for us as an ensemble, we, if we come to a festival like one of your festivals, uh, what we look for, for is to perhaps uh, give a workshop in a school, uh, present uh, a, a talk to, to students. Um, of course, the evening concert is, uh, is the main thing probably, but um, I would like to ask perhaps uh, Miguel Angel, if uh, you said, you mentioned that you, you, you have like 160 concerts in nine months, this is a lot. And uh, especially um, thinking about sustainability and uh, now after Corona, would it be, um, um, yeah, would it be an idea to, to develop a, a deeper relationship with an ensemble to invite them for a longer tour and for uh, if they, they offer workshops and things like that, um, concert for seniors, for example, or different formats that, that uh, can be developed, if that's uh, an option for you and how, how can you tackle this? How can we develop this together? Thank you, Alon. Miguel Angel? Well, there, there are many questions in, in, in your only question. And, um, uh, well, I mean, the first thing will be, you know, kind of more theoretical approach. The first um, thing will be to do some kind of research on what kind of uh, profiles of listeners you have in your festival or you have in your, in your, in your concert hall or what kind of uh, profiles you would like to have. And there are already some, some um, uh, experts uh, trying to identify and classify the different uh, listeners you've got in your, in your institution. For instance, I know, at least in, in this. Sorry? Yeah, the microphone was off, but now it's okay. Okay, some, some institutions in, in Barcelona that got some uh, financial support to develop that kind of research, uh, mainly through, through questionnaires, um, to identify and classify the different profiles of listeners that usually attend concerts at the Palau, for instance. Or you can do the same in museums, or you can do the same in, in, in theaters. So once you identify the kind of uh, profiles you've got, the reasons why people go to your concert, what they're expecting to find in your concerts uh, or in your, in, your, in your place. And once you've got that kind of thing, that kind of um, uh, radiographic, that kind of, 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 of um, mm, 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 research done, then you can start making decisions 
uh, in terms of programming, but also decisions in terms of, 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 of what you offer in, in the cafeteria or how parking works and all these kind of things. We will just we'll be dealing with marketing, all these things that are not the core of the things we are discussing. Um, so in, in, in theoretical terms, there is a way to know that, but this implies research and deeply implies also money. And um, you may want an institution may need to, to decide if they want to, to go for that or not. And now, in more uh, practical, uh, more practical approach. I also know some some examples of institutions of uh, ensembles and groups that have been developing similar projects. Are the one you were mentioning before, um, uh, particularly addressed to a specific segment of their community. For instance, you perhaps know that orchestras in the south of the states, uh, in California, for instance, they've been developing more Iberian or more uh, Latin, as they call it, more Latin music to connect to the Latin community that is very, very uh, well uh, represented in, in the cities. For instance, Los Angeles, um, you know, Dudamel was also doing that kind of thing. Programming Mexican music or Latin music that goes from Mexico to Argentina and to Spain for then this is all Latin thing uh, in order to seduce the Latin community that lived in the States. Uh, I've got some, I know some, some examples also in, in, in New York. Um, um, Angel Hill is the conductor, I can't remember now the, the name of the group, that they have also been developing a specific program addressed to a specific segment of the community in New York in order to, 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 to uh, trigger close connection to the community. That's also a way of, of doing things, of, of kind of programming, thinking of particular uh, uh, segments of, of your, of your uh, community. Now, it depends very much on the institutions, depends very much of the aim of, 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 the, of the programmer and, um, and everything can work. I presume Daniel also have all these kind of things in mind when they invite some people in Musica and Segura because depending very much on the kind of community he's addressing the, the, uh, the, the, the programs. Um, in our case, in the particular case of the Fundación Juan March, uh, we haven't done that kind of research. So we don't know very well the specific profile of listeners we, uh, uh, we have. And that is becoming more and more complicated because we are developing a very strong uh, uh, way of a very strong um, 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 process of um, streaming of streaming music and recording music. So if you start recording and streaming your concerts, this become more and more complicated uh, to identify the kind of listener you are addressing to. But uh, for me, it's useful to think of the ideal listeners I've got in mind when I uh, design programming. I don't know exactly who's going to listen to our concerts, but I can have the ideal listeners I have in mind I would like to address my concerts. And if you have that in mind, it helps you to, to make some decisions. It doesn't mean that it's going to work always, because you may have listeners that are not part of this ideal image you've got in your mind, but you need to have someone in your mind when you're programming. And anything is the same with, with musicians. Musicians tend to imagine a kind of listeners, ideal listeners, that they will let you address their concerts uh, without knowing if, if they will be there in the, in the concert hall or not. But uh, you need somehow always to imagine some, someone more or less specific because otherwise you may have the risk of, of losing yourself in the middle of the ocean with a completely different uh, listeners uh, uh, in your mind. Uh, so I find that useful. Um, well, I don't know if that answered your question, but your question was already very, very complicated one. I think Daniel Broncano wants to add something also. Yes, in uh, Music Insegura, we, we target for a very specific kind of listener and uh, community, and that's everyone who's got uh, one brain and two ears, uh, two years. So that's uh, probably 6,000 million people, as broad as that. And I think that in early music and classical music, we need that. Uh, we have, and that's the challenge for the programmer and for the curator 
it's to really uh, stretch out and really reach out. And uh, I think we have to give credit uh, to the power of music, to the power of uh, intelligence and, and culture. And I think that uh, that's the success of, of music. And so we're operating in a very rural area where uh, everybody said at the beginning that we have to bring music down to the population here. And I think that is on the contrary. We have to um, give credit to the power of one brain and two ears. And music is not intellectual. Music is only emotions and everybody can be, um, can, can be seduced and can have a huge impact by it. Of course, there are different marketing details about how to do for one or the other, but, but I think that uh, my approach is much broader. I think that, of course, there's the, the, the uh, niche of school concerts and maybe seniors or, or maybe people with learning disabilities or, or mixed abilities. But in general, I think that, that early music and, and classical music that is not mainstream, I don't think we can afford to go much more um, smaller than, than everybody. And I think that people come to me, to our concerts because of our brand, because they think, uh, yeah, because everybody wants to come because of a more general marketing. What you said alone is, is really interesting about um, uh, giving a, or, or producing a bigger impact in the community where you go. And I think that is uh, not only for, for sustainability in terms of um, uh, traveling, it's also because of financial reasons for, for the festival. And uh, we have this residency program where we are keen for groups to come and, and produce something new that then is presented in the festival. Uh, and uh, Jorge knows because uh, he's been part of that. He's been performing in, uh, in senior houses in, in the area. So it's, it's part of our philosophy that, that does, uh, yeah, that ensembles don't come here only for uh, the evening concert, but only for, also for the morning concert, the afternoon concert and, and every, everything we can. Thank you, Daniel. I think uh, before the ending, uh, Joanna also wanted to say something. Joanna? Yes, yeah. Maria. Mike. Uh, I uh, wanted to talk a bit about the sustainability and the kind of, uh, let's call it, residency that you have in mind. Uh, it's actually very interesting and we've been thinking about it a lot, but, uh, and it can be especially important with the pandemic situation will keep going. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's difficult, especially in Poland as, uh, as, as a whole. Um, we don't have many residency programs dedicated to an ensembles and developing something like this would require, of course, uh, a lot of money and building the whole programs dedicated to that kind of, uh, th that kind of idea. Um, I think that it cannot be done in only one place, in only one city. Uh, I'm going to only talk from uh, my country experience and my, my uh, Polish market, early music market. Um, as much as it is very interesting, it would require money that we, none of the institutions would, would be able to require for hosting a group for extended period of time. And that would be sufficient for this group to build any kind of real relationship with the audience or uh, have, having much bigger uh, impact on the community. But I think if we could think more regionally, like have the south of the country and get on board more uh, institutions, festivals dedicated to early music or with early music programs that are supported by the government and try to build a program like that for this ensemble to be there and to travel between the cities. And uh, that could work, but also it's something that could require a lot of time to build and to create and to require the sufficient uh, budget to be for us to be able to make it uh, work. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you, Daniel. Also, 
Pierre, and Miguel Angel, and also Alon, Paula, Johanna, David Gutierrez, and all those that are watching this in YouTube this afternoon. Uh, we could not meet today uh, in Sierra Espuña. We, our thoughts and our hearts are with the people from Aledo and Totana that are in a new situation of confinement. But our minds uh, are also here talking about new formats, about early music, thanks to the University of Murcia, Acción Cultural Española, and the six uh, councils of Sierra Espuña. Before saying goodbye, um, I would like to hear a last sentence from each of the speakers uh, to talk to the to the young groups, the, the young musicians that uh, are willing to share the art and to find new, uh, new formats, new ways to, to approach and to, to, to be relevant with their music and with their performance. So um, I think as the, Pierre was the last one on talking, uh, he will be the first uh, uh, to, to give his message. Well, thank you very much, Jorge, for this uh, very interesting initiative. And coming both from a festival and an ensemble, it's really, really interesting. And uh, many thanks to all the people here. And I would just say, I would encourage young ensembles to, uh, to propose everything they have in mind. Don't be shy. Don't be afraid to be too innovative or not enough innovative. Just, just show us what you want to do. And maybe a close relationship to a programmer as we can have with, with Prisma, for example, in the frame of the Emerging Plus project, we have this mentorship thing and, and I'm, I talk with them, they talk with me and we can exchange ideas. And it's like, a, you know, it can be like a crash test for, for, for innovative ideas. Is it okay? Is it not okay? Maybe just, and it's not about programming. It's not about just making concerts, it's about Tell, um, talking about about the ideas and just seeing if these ideas are good or if they are not and maybe after it will help everyone to to evolve so thank you very much Jorge. Thank you also Pierre for being here and I will listen to Daniel. Yes uh, thank you very much for organizing this it's very um, useful for for us as well um, I would like to, to expand a little bit what, what Pierre uh, has just said. I think that, that for us, when we receive proposals, sometimes uh, we, we are not looking for the, com for the end product and it's even more useful when we receive uh, two, three embryos of ideas, pitch it there, because then we like to, to shape them together. So I, I would encourage not to spend a lot of time with the polishing the, the end product because in order to, to keep the conversation going, uh, it's more important to inspire with, with the embryos of the ideas. Thank you, Daniel and Joanna from Mysteria Pascalia. Uh, thank you as well for having me here and for this uh, wonderfully uh, inspiring uh, talk. And Yes, I would also like to say what Pierre and Daniel uh, said, that uh, the promoters are looking less and less for something that is ready-made product. They uh, have specific teams for their festivals, so uh, the more open you are to collaborate, to change the programs, to work on new ones, the more uh, uh, the more likely you are going to be invited. and. It is very encouraging that the younger groups, young groups are already thinking about their music and their formats in a new innovative ways. They are not, they're already looking into building a close relationship with the audiences and with the promoters and uh, just continue doing that. And I think you're all on a, on a good way. Uh, so just continue on. Thank you, Johanna. And we will uh, listen now to Miguel Angel from Fundación Juan Marc. Well, my, my piece of advice could be to, to keep your eyes open and um, get inspiration in what's going on in many different places and many different festivals and many different cities. There are a lot of things, very original things going on. So keep an eye on them. Uh, keep your mind uh, also wide and, 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 and be ready to receive things that will change your mind that's also a very good attitude in life i think uh be brave in 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 proposing different things but also find a kind of justification when you do things 
try to avoid doing new things just for the sake of being new, just trying to find arguments, justification, explanation to do things in a different way. Um, my experience is people, both programmers and listeners, are, generally speaking, ready to receive new things, but they, they need to be told why that new thing is worthy. So find your arguments, find your narrative to explain things, not just because they are news, just because you are finding something uh, uh, something new that is worthy to be done. That's, that's also very, very important, I think. So good luck. Thank you all for sharing all this knowledge and all these ideas, also your questions for the, for the groups, the ensembles that has been here. Uh, we continue tomorrow talking about communication and also on the weekend we will listen our small micro concerts and we hope uh, we will meet next year in Sierra Espuña in our fifth edition and we can welcome you all to play or to talk or to listen to early music. Goodbye. <laughs>